I'm just going to finish up one quick thing from this intro, uh, and then we're going to launch in. Now, just to remind you, I warned you last time, but I'll, I'll do it again right now. Uh, we're going in deep uh, today and next week. So it's just going to be math, and it's going to be disconnected from anything. You, if, if you don't have the feeling, why did all these people recommend this class uh, sometime like next week, maybe even today, maybe while you're doing homework one? which, by the way, is assigned, um, then, I mean, it, that's completely normal, right? So uh, what I, I do promise you, though, that everything we see here, um, you will see in the context of applications later in the course. And actually, so that means something about how you might, how I would suggest that you learn the material. So uh, you can't just, I mean, I don't know, it depends on, I mean, okay, I'll just speak for myself. It's hard for me just to like hear some math and then think about it and go, okay, cool, I'm, I'm done. I have to see how people use it and stuff like that. So what I would suggest is you just get the basic ideas right now, uh, big picture. I mean, you'll do some homework, that'll help. There'll be sections, all that sort of stuff. Um, then what's gonna happen is you don't have to have perfect mastery of the material we're gonna cover in the next two weeks. You don't have to have that before we move on. Um, if you get like 70% mastery, you're cool, that's fine. And the reason is what's gonna happen is after that, then we're gonna look at applications and we'll be doing statistics and we'll be doing control and signal, pro we'll doing all sorts of stuff. We'll use it and you'll, and you'll look up and you go, okay, now I know what the conjugate is, okay? Or something like that. But for right now, it's just gonna be weird abstract, just that's just what it is, okay? So, all right. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll go ahead and start. Actually, what I did wanna do is say just a little bit about the brief history of, of convex optimization, just to give some historical background. So the first thing is that as a, as a mathematical field, it's at least 120 years old, right? So uh, you know, people were writing down inequalities that we would now say, hey, that's convex, you know, that, that's convexity. They were writing this down in the late 19th century. Okay? That was codified uh, right around the turn of the last century. Um, so well, I guess whatever, a century and 1.2 centuries ago. Um, so that was, that was codified and someone said, look, we keep seeing the same stupid inequality all the time. Let's give it a name. And that's when the name became basically convexity. Okay, so, um, so as a mathematical field, it was really already quite well developed in the 20s, 50s. By the 70s, I would just say it was done, right? There was like a beautiful book written on convex analysis. If, if you do math and are interested in math, you could read it. It's a beautiful book. And that's just it. That just, it just kind of, you know, has, have people done stuff since then? Yeah, sure. But basically that was it. It was just clean, wrapped up. Um, I mean, it doesn't say anything about what you do with it. How do you apply it? How do you actually do algorithmic things with it? Or like how do you actually solve these problems? But just as a mathematical field, it's super, it, it's interesting. And I'd even encourage you to poke through that book if you, if, if, if you have that, um, proclivity, right, to the, the math proclivity, right? I, I, would, I would actually suggest looking at it. Okay, so, you know, what, when it really takes off, I mean, and this is not, you know, this is kind of, you know, roughly somewhere around, you know, the 1940s. Now, this is, it's not accidental that that coincides with the development, basically, of the computer, right? So, you know, because, I mean, to me, the exciting part is we can actually do all this. Like, everything in this class is actionable. And that's very different from just taking a math class, right? Where it's all super interesting, but who, who knows what fraction of it is action. Everything we do is actionable. So, so for us, the real interesting history starts around then, the development of computers, right? So, and right around then, uh, people were developing uh, like the simplex algorithm. That's a, a very famous algorithm for linear programming. There's a strong Stanford connection. Actually, one of the people who popularized that was George Danzig. He was a professor here. Um, so that, that, that's kind of the, you know, the early, early part of it. Um, now, there was a, a big burst of work. I will, mention, I will refer to it a whole bunch of times. Um, and a lot, honestly, a lot of the work that goes beyond linear programming occurred in the Soviet Union in the 60s through, basically through the 70s and 80s, right? So there was a lot of work there. We'll get to some of that uh, later. Um, and of course, you know, since about the 2000s, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of it was picked up by people in statistics and machine learning and things like that. So there was a lot of stuff done, done after that. Um, I think the applications are actually sort of interesting, right? So the applications go back to the 1940s and 50s. We'll actually look at some of them, which is actually kind of fun because they're just historical examples of, of things. Um, 
But actually, already in like the 1950s, people in aerospace were designing extremely light structures, the lightest possible structure that would handle the required loads, dynamic and static loads. So that was already, you know, and it should be totally obvious, that's unbelievably important in aerospace, right? Right, because every, every, everything you, you have in your frame or whatever is, just takes away from your payload, period, right? So, so that's an example very early of people doing this. In electrical engineering, people were like designing FIR filters, right? Again, in the 60s, right? So there's a lot of, so you would find little bits and pieces, but I would say that the floodgates kind of opened in the late 90s, early 2000s, right? And that, there was a lot of stuff in control and signal processing, communications, uh, that, that, that sort of happened right around that time, right? And people figured out that if you're trying to allocate power to a bunch of wireless systems, then a lot of these problems, they're just convex, okay? And so those, are, and those, are actually, those methods are actually kind of used. Okay, and like I said, a lot of stuff uh, was, was uh, done um, in maybe, let's see, Maybe the heyday was about 10 years ago uh, when people were looking at mod models in statistics and machine learning that involved convex optimization problems. We'll look at a lot of those. These would be like things like lo logistic regression, uh, support vector machines, and things like that, right? So, and now the good news, I mean, good news, people uh, worked on various methods that we're not gonna cover, subgradient type methods, right? So we're not gonna cover those methods. And then those turned out to be the methods that are actually the ones used today on non-convex things like training neural networks. Okay, so there's your there's your there's your your big uh, your, your your big picture. Okay, so at this point, uh, unless there's questions, um, we're we're jumping in, and this is the deep end. So this is not we're not in the it, we're just going to jump right in. Okay, so the uh, and again to remind you what the whole point of all this is is this is not a class about math. It's a class about actually applying these methods. And so when you apply these methods, you r arrive at a, you know, at a startup or, or an internship or something like that, or your research, and there's a practical problem you wanna solve. I mean, that, that's, that, that's the setting we're talking about here. And then you have to sort through and try to figure out, I mean, if it's convex, I mean, could, you know, which parts of it are convex, these kinds of things. And so absolutely critical is to be able to recognize you know, things like a convex set and a convex function. We'll talk about convex sets today, convex functions next week. So, the, so the, that's, the, that's the actual practical skill that we are after, right? So, okay, I mean, it is interesting theory and it's interesting as theory and it's just fine, but the point is that's the skill we're after, right? So, um, okay, so what we'll do is we're gonna, st I'm gonna start with like super basic and it, it's gonna accelerate after that. So let's start, go back way to the beginning. So at the beginning, it goes like this. I, I just have two vectors, x1 and x2, and you know, uh, you know, n-dimensional space or something like that. And um, what I do is let's suppose that they are not equal to each other. And I'm gonna form this specific linear combination here, right? So that linear combination has got two coefficients, theta and one minus theta. They're sort of interesting because they add up to one. Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's critical, okay? Now, what, what geometrically, what this is, is this, as you vary theta, this sketches out the line that in, 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 in this space that passes through x1 and x2. So that's what that is. It's a, in fact, you would call this a parameterization of the line. It's parameterized by theta. Right, so theta equals zero means that you're at x2. Theta equals one means you're at x1. Theta equals a half means you're at kind of the midpoint between x1 and x2, okay? So this is the, again, it's, you know, it's all just, just, just to go back to the beginning and make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, okay, so uh, this is called an affine combination. So a linear combination is, well, you know what a linear combination is. It's a sum of vectors with multiplied by some coefficients, right? Um, but when those coefficients add up to one, that's special, and that's called an affine combination. Okay, so that's an affine combination. So, so this is, you know, the simplest affine combination you could possibly have. Okay. Um, all right. Now, an affine set is, is then defined to be uh, a set. It contains the line through any two distinct points in the set. In other words, it roughly, I mean, you might say informally something like this. It's closed under forming a line or something like that. So, in other words, if two points are in the set, the entire line is in the set. 
Okay, so that's that's an affine set, and we, you'll see lots of examples. But you know, a famous one would be this: um, the solution set of a set of linear inequalities. So the set of x for which a x equals b is going to be an affine set. Um, and by the way, you can check. I mean, you know, I, a lot of things I'm going to say. Honestly, you might want to do something weird, like just with probability point one, audit that, right? And which means try to show it. So in this case, what you'd do is you'd have to say, well. Let's see if this is an affine set. To do that, you would say, well, let's suppose x1 and x2 are both solutions of ax equals b, right? So that's the first step. Then you'd say, let's let theta be any number at all. And now, then you'd form theta x1 plus 1 minus theta x2. And you'd want to show that that point also satisfies ax equals b. I mean, it's quite straightforward. I'm not going to do it. But I would recommend that you, you know, I'll say stuff. And you just sit there and you go, cool, yeah. I mean, it's probably true if I say it, right? So you can trust me. But I would actually kind of suggest that you audit it. Like every, every you know, every 10th thing, you just say, I'm going to show that, right? Because I will say stuff without many, most of what I'm going to say, I'm not going to justify. OK? OK. Now, it turns out this is not just a good example. It's generic. So every affine set is the solution set of a set of linear inequalities. OK? And again, I'm not going to show that. OK. But this brings us to convex set. So if theta, in this affine combination, if theta is between 0 and 1, then this traces out the line segment between x1 and x2, right? And by the way, some people actually write it this way. I mean, and I'm totally OK with that. They write x1, x2, like that. P perfectly OK. Um, now, I mean, we all know and agree on what that means if x1 and x2 are numbers. I mean, assuming in that case it's conventional for x2 to be bigger than x1. But nevertheless, we know what this means, right? Um, but this is for, for vectors. This would be the line segment, right? This is not standard notation. OK. Um, by the way, in this case, this is called either a convex combination of x1 and x2. But you're going to find other names in other things. And some of them are quite descriptive. Here's one. It's a mixture. So. It's, it's just, it's a mixture of x1 and x, like everyone gets it. And so then you'd say, well, it's 22% of that and 78% of that, right? So it's a mixture, right? And there's other names too, and I'm forgetting what they are. But you'd, in different fields, you'd find different names for a convex combination. Okay. So a convex set is one that says, any two, if you have any two points in the set, the line segment between them is in the set. Another way to say it is, any two points in the set have a, a clear line of sight to each other, right? That, that's what it says, OK? And so, you know, here's some, I mean, these are silly examples, but, you know, here's like a little, a little convex set. Um, it's dark here. That means it contains its boundary. And this is, this is convex, and we can kind of check, right? Because <clears throat> what you do is you'd say, well, look, if I take any two points, here's one, and here's the other. And then I would simply visualize the segment in between them. Sure enough, it's inside the set. It's all cool, right? Um, this one is not convex, right? And I have a, a counterexample right here, which is here's a point in the set. Here's a point in the set. This is the line segment. And you can see it goes outside the set, OK? So that's that. That one, this one is also not convex. But because it's weird, I don't know if you can see, but there are gaps in the boundary here. And I could have two points on the boundary here. They're both in the set. But the line segment is not entirely in the set. OK? So, so this is it's all. This, this is kind of this is at the center of the course, right? So there's something, there's going to be something special about convex sets. OK. Um, now, if you have, if you have a, 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 an affine combination with all the coefficients non-negative, right? So that, that's, that's going to look like this. So x is a linear combination of x1 through xk. These are vectors, right? Number one is linear combination. Number two, the coefficients add up to one. That makes it an affine combination. And number three, they're all non-negative. That makes it a convex combination. Otherwise, you know, some people call this a mixture. Uh, I mean, you know, sometimes they say it's a weighted sum or weighted average. You know, some I've heard people say it's a weighted average, which is what it is. It's an expectation in probability, right? That if, if you take the thetas to be the probabilities, of a random vector that takes the values x1 through xk, then this is the expected value. That's expected value of whatever these things, that random variable. OK. So that's a convex combination. 
And so the convex hull is going, we, that is actually, it's the set of a set, is, it's the set of all convex combinations of points from that set. So that's what the convex hull is, right? Um, so here's an example over here. So this is, this is a finite set, here are these points, right? And then what, what's drawn here uh, in, in gray, that's the convex hull of these points, right? And, and you can check, like, you know, if there's a point, uh, you, know, you know, how do you know this is in the convex hull? Well, it's like, well, that one was right on the line between these two, but, you know, uh, here's, you know, how do you know this point is in the convex hull? Well, it's kind of, it's, it's one third, one third, one third of this, right? So that, that's how that got there, right? And so that's, that's kind of the picture. Um, let me ask you a couple questions just for fun. Um, are the coefficients, uh, that point is in the, this point is in the convex hull right here. And my question is, is there just one set of thetas? No. no, that's not right, right? Because, in fact, if it's in any, like, triangle, uh, if it's in different triangles, then it, they, th there can be different thetas, right? So th those coefficients are not unique, right? So, okay. All right. So this is the convex uh, hull. Okay. Um, convex cone. So, um, so a conic or... Non-negative, some people call it a non-negative linear, com linear combination. That's another name for it. So that's basically a, a linear combination of things, but the coefficients have to be non-negative. And in fact, you might even, some people actually say, like someone says, what is convex analysis? And here's one pretty good answer. It's like linear algebra, but we introduce asymmetries, like the coefficients are non-negative, right? In linear algebra, you don't have these distinctions, right? Or you don't. You know, that's, that's not a main point of linear algebra. You have linear combination. Here we have non-negative combination. So, th so that, that's one way to say it. It's like bringing asymmetry to linear algebra. Okay, so this, uh, so this, is, th th this would be, you know, for example, uh, a, a, that's a conic combination provided these, these two numbers are non-negative, right? And if you want to visualize what it does, it's like something like this. It makes like this little pie shape thing. Here's zero, here's x1, here's x2. And, you know, uh, someone suggest, how do, how do I get this point in the con conic hull? Suggest a theta 1 and theta 2, please. Right there. I mean, just approximately. I'm waiting. Any suggestion? That one point right there. What is it? Like one half and one fifth. One half and one fifth. Yeah, okay. I, I trust you. That's, that sounds good to me. I was just, I was going to go like one fifth, one fifth, or, but no, you're probably, that's fine. That's good enough. Yeah. So that's it. So, so that's, that's what a, that's what a, a, a convex cone is. Right. So, um, again, you know, none of what we're saying is in any practical context. So you're like, I mean, a perfectly reasonable question is who cares? We will get to that. So there's a question. Uh, is the right most picture also a hole? And is yes. It Yes. So I will show you what that is. Um, so it's this is this this uh, this thing here is, is a is a uh, is not a convex set, right? It's a non-convex set. This thing, and the convex hull consists of all, you know, it anything that is a convex combination of any two points in that set. So this is already sort sort of in it, but what's going to happen is like here, this. It says that everything on this line segment is in the convex hull, but I can move these points around. And, and basically, uh, I could even take a point there and a point there, and then sort of everything along there would, would also be in the convex hull. So if you look carefully at the next one, you'll see that that's the convex hull of the, of, of the original set. So that makes sense? Yeah, so, yeah. So the convex hull is like the smallest convex set that contains S. Right? That is precisely correct. That's right. So the convex hull of a set is the smallest convex set that contains a set. That's right. Right. So, and weirdly it has, these things actually have weird, a lot of like practical applications, which we'll get to later. Yeah. How does the picture for the convex cone have the zero point, but not the other uh, Ah, sets? great question. So, um, so Actually, so here, if we go to a, a conic combination, um, the thetas could be, I, here's a valid choice of theta, ready? 
Theta 1 equals 0, theta 2 equals 0. Then I get 0. So 0 is always in a, uh, is always a, is always a conic combination of any set of vectors, except empty set, but that's silly, right? Okay, so that's, you're not allowed to do that. For convex, the coefficients have to add up to 1, and you can't say 0, 0. You can say 0, 1, you can say 1 third, 2 thirds, but you cannot say 0, 0. Does that make, make sense? Okay, cool. Yes? Uh, do, does the convex hull necessarily contain its boundary? Uh, does it necessarily contain, a, contain its boundary? Um, it doesn't necessarily. Yeah. So, um, oh, also, maybe I'll, 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 I'll mention uh, something. Um, you're welcome to, so you're getting off, a little bit getting close to analysis, which is fine. I think it's great. I mean, I, I was trained in math. I, I, you know, so, um, but um, we're not going to focus in this class on the analysis. And I, I mean, uh, by the way, questions like that, by all means, ask. Um, but if you start asking like very esoteric, weird questions that only people who speak the dialect of analysis know, um, I'll just say we'll talk about it later. Okay. So, so th this 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 was below that threshold and a great question. But in general, right? And you can do that, right? So you can if if you if you actually are interested in the math and you want to know about you know does this work if that's closed and blah 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 and you know what limits of that and all that kind of stuff, you you would speak to um, the TAs or me. But we'll only do it in, we won't do it in public, though, because you're not, you shouldn't, you shouldn't talk about detailed, well, you're just not supposed to speak a weird dialect in public when no one understands, right? So um, if you don't know analysis, it's, you're actually going to be just fine in the class. Um, so you, you'll be just fine, right? So there'll be some terms. We will give you the colloquial translation of the term, and you will be just fine, right? So, so don't worry about that. You might, by the way, if you're, like doing a PhD in a field where people use math, even incidentally, I would strongly recommend you do take analysis. Let, shall I explain why? Yeah, so here's why. You might ask, oh, will I use the material? No, you'll never use it, okay? Uh, it's super interesting, right? But the thing about it, you, you, use, you take analysis for mostly, at least for some set of people. Here in math, you take it because you have to. It's the, um, you, well, you want to, I should say, right? Or something's wrong, right? So you take it for intellectual self-defense. That's why you take it. If you don't take it, well, let's suppose you do a prop, suppose you do a PhD in statistics or something, right? I did something, you know, that's math adjacent, right? So you're at a conference someday, five years from now, and you give a perfectly good paper, everything that you said is right, it's interesting. Some jerk in the back raises the hand and says, Oh, you know, is that com is that weak star compact or in and and if you've had analysis and you look at them and you go number one yes number two totally irrelevant okay if you haven't had analysis you'll go like oh oh I don't know ah, I don't, and and, it'll, and you'll have a crisis and all that kind of, so I'm just saying that's why it's worth a ten week investment taking analysis I mean like for math adjacent courses like suppose you do robotics right and by the way there are these people out there. I, I, I know them. <laughs> yeah. The other thing, okay, on, on, on that same topic, another one is this. For people who do know analysis, uh, <coughs> some of them, uh, they, you will be judged. If you have a hick mathemat uh, mathematical dialect, and you're not, if you know what you're talking about but not quite using the right word, yeah, people in the room who know analysis will exchange glances and nothing needs to be said. You are being judged. Okay, so anyway, fine. That's my pitch for taking analysis, right? So, okay, it was weird. Yes? Why don't the data need to sum to one for the context of Ah, why don't they need to sum to one? Uh, well, this is just a definition. So it, it is simply by fiat and by definition that a conic combination, they don't have to add up to one, right? So, so that, that's, that's the origin of where that, that, so in a convex combination, it is simply part of the definition that they add up to one. So it's, it's literally by definition or by fiat or whatever. It's just, yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. So now we'll, we'll get to some stuff that people, I mean, hopefully a lot of this so far is, is reviews. I mean, some of it will not be review uh, later. We'll, we'll, we'll get to some interesting stuff soon. But, okay. So first one is, you know, everyone knows what a hyperplane is. So a hyperplane is, 
it's the set, actually it's the solution set of a single non-zero linear equation. That's, that's what a hyperplane is, right? And you know what a hyperplane looks like. You know, in two dimensions, you know, it looks like this. Here's a hyperplane there. That's everything on that line, right? Uh, satisfies a two-dimensional equation. I mean, sorry, a single, a single equation in two variables, right? So that's what it means. You know, and in three space, it's like a, it's actually literally a hyperplane. It's a plane, right? And then in higher dimensions, it, it's what people call a hyperplane. Okay, so that's, a, that's that. Um, that's just like, you know, kind of linear in algebra. Now let's make it interesting and make it, let, let's make it asymmetric, right? So this is called a half space. So what happens is if it's the set of points, not that have a transpose x equals b, but a transpose x is less than or equal to b. So that's a, so it's actually, it's the solution set of a single non-zero linear inequality. Okay, that's what you would call this, right? And that's a half space. And it looks like this, you know, roughly speaking, you know, this, this is the, this, these are all the points where a transpose x equals b. These are all the points where a transpose x is bigger than b. And here's where a transpose x is less than or equal to b. So that, that's the idea. And there's a lot of ways to think of it geometrically. Um, one, one way is to say, so here, A is the outward normal of that half space. That's what people say. Normal means it's perpendicular to the hyperplane. Outward means it points out, okay? So, so it's oriented, right? And you don't have concepts like outward in linear algebra, right? You just have equality, con you know, equality constraints and sub subspaces, affine sets. Yes? Uh, say that again, what? Like, it's a magnitude of A has to be 1. No, no. So, like, if it's not 1, you can still find I, I No, I, I, if, 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 if something like that is required, I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm a kind of a full disclosure person, right? So, so there's not going to be anything hidden here, like, oh, I didn't tell you A is non-negative or something. So, no, A is completely general. Coefficients, the norm can be anything you like, doesn't matter, right? Okay. Um, Okay, so hyperplanes, um, they're, they're affine sets. Oh, by the way, any affine set is convex, right? Um, half spaces are convex, right? I mean, it's, I mean, it's getting, don't worry, it starts, this can start slow, but trust me, by the end of the day, we're gonna get to some weird stuff, okay? That you didn't know, I bet, okay? So, okay, next up are Euclidean uh, balls and ellipsoids, right? So, um, so uh, in this class, it's a, little, it's a step up mathematically. So we use the standard notation is that when we have a norm, if it's a sub two, that means the Euclidean norm. It's the square to the sum of the squares. Um, if it doesn't have a two there, it's a generic norm. It's any norm. We'll get to that in a minute. But that's how we're going to, that, that, that's the notation, which is completely standard notation. So that's what we're going to do. Um, so this is what a ball is. A ball is the set of points where the norm of x minus a given vector called xc, the center, is less than or equal to r, where r is a positive number called the radius. Okay, so that's that's what a that's what a that, that's what a Euclidean ball, you know, with center x c and radius r is, right? So that's 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 what that is, um, and uh, you know these are are convex. I mean, you'd want to show that it's actually not too hard. You'd uh, probably some Cauchy Schwartz thing or something would come in, and everything would be fine. Um, Let's see, an ellipsoid, that's something I'm, I'm sure everyone has seen in one field or another, or should have, right? And um, so that's a set that looks, and there's lots of ways to write ellipsoids, which is actually kind of interesting. And later in the class, about five weeks in, we're gonna be doing things like optimizing over ellipsoids. We'll be doing things like finding the maximum volume ellipsoid that fits inside something, or the minimum volume ellipsoid that covers something. And we'll actually use different parameterizations of ellipsoids to to solve those problems, right? So there's lots of different ways to write them, okay? So one way is this, is you say, it's a set of all points where this is a quadratic form. When you say x minus xc transpose p inverse x minus xc is less than or equal to one. By the way, if p is equal to the, you know, the identity, I guess if it's called, if it's little r times the identity, this is identical with that. It's the same as a Euclidean ball, right? But the ellipsoid allows it to have different, it can have, it, it has different, uh, you know, diameters in different directions, roughly. And I think, I think you've, 
you, you've probably seen these, these things, right? Here's some notation. So uh, bold SN is going to be the set of symmetric n by n matrices. That's, a, that's, a, that's an affine set. It's a vector space. Um, when we put a sub plus plus, it means it's positive definite. So these are symmetric positive definite matrices, right? And with a plus, it's just po it's positive semi-definite. Okay, so that's going to be our, our, our notation, right? And you know, here's an ellipsoid. I mean, it's not that exciting. Um, here's an alternate representation, right? Which, which is interesting, right? And so what, you'd, what you really want to think about uh, when you do this is, I mean, you could imagine if, you know, di different ways to translate between the different representations or parameterization of an ellipsoid, right? Or, and for example, you might even think in an object-oriented thing, you might actually say, like, you might have to implement the equals equals method. The equals equals method says, when is one ellipsoid equal to another? Okay? So, and it's kind of interesting, the answer. It's not totally straightforward. Um, if, the, if, it is rep, if, if you represent an ellipsoid this way, can someone tell me what the equals equals method is? When are two ellipsoids equal? When, when parameterized in terms of P and XC? XC is equal and PR equal? Yeah, they're equal. Yeah, the XC has, one X, XC has to equal XC prime, and P has to equal P prime. That's exactly right. Okay? How about this one? by a rotation? Or yeah, that's true? right. So the two A's have to be related by a rotation, right? And, and how would you figure that out? Well, linear algebra. I mean, we're not going to go into it. So I'm just saying in that case, the, e the equals equals method, right, is not that simple to implement, right? It, it's not as straightforward. Okay, so these are Euclidean balls and ellipsoids. And these are, so what we're doing is we're actually going through and looking at some very common convex sets, right? So you will, you'll never again, Next time you see an ellipsoid or a half space, you'll just know it's convex. Is a question. Oh, why, is, why the definition of P inverse here instead of P? Is that just you, to signify that? You could use, yeah, so the question is why P inverse here and not P? The truth is you could use either because the inverse of a symmetric positive definite matrix is positive definite. So, and people do. Sometimes it's convenient to make that not P, but P inverse. Sorry, you know what I meant. Right, and so not P inverse, but P, or something like that. Yeah, so good, good question. Yes? Is the second definition A doesn't have a constraint on it, other than mean squared and all things. So like, what's the way to think about the translation that's happening about, about X? Oh, uh, this one? So I can, if I want to make A, I could insist that A is symmetric, positive, definite. So every representation of this form has one with A symmetric, positive, definite. And then, then the equals equals method is very simple, right? So, okay. So we'll, we'll move on. Okay. Then we have the idea of uh, norm balls. So here I just have a, a general norm. And I, again, I'm going to review the fact that, you know, you're at a level of mathematical sophistication where you might as well just use the standard, the standard for what it means to be a norm, right? So a norm is just a function. It is, it, it's written by convention at, with this weird infix form. In other words, you, you put the argument in the middle and you put these double bars. And the double bars, right, are supposed to suggest to you that this is a generalization of the absolute value for reals, right? I mean, you probably knew all this and I'm sure you've seen this, right? So, but a norm is any function that is non-negative. This is called definite. It says that it is zero only if the norm is zero, right? And uh, it's homogeneous of degree one. That's what this says. And it satisfies the triangle inequality, right? And there's a bunch of norms. You know, this. well, there's a lot of norms, right? Um, in this class, when we write down, I mean, this is just completely standard notate, mathematical notation. A norm is just a norm. It's just, it's any function that satisfies these three things, period, right? Um, and if we want to indicate a particular norm, we'll put a mnemonic or some kind of symbol below it to tell you what norm it is, right? So, um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll do stuff like that. And there'll be some interesting ones, right? Um, okay, uh, let's see. Um, we could look at a norm ball. That's the same thing here, except that instead of using a Euclidean norm, you might use a, you know, a different norm, right? So, for example, I'll just write down some of these things. The infinity norm 
of, I'll just do two vec, uh, a two vector, right? This is the max of x1 and x2, right? Looks like that, OK? And so the Euclidean, so if I write, let's see if I have some, do I have, did I introduce some notation for that? No, nah, I didn't. That's fine. OK, so um, if I write down this, right, the set of x, right, for which, you know, x minus here, you know, 1, 1, uh, you know, infinity is less than a half, right? That, that is, we would call that, you would say that's an L infinity norm ball. That would be the, 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 the dialect. That's not really a dialect. That's high standard BBC mathematics. Anyone who knows any math would understand exactly what you're saying completely unambiguously. So technically, that's not a dialect, okay? So, and this would look, you know, something like this, right? Here's the point one, one, and then you would have a, a set that looks like that. And that's, that, that would be an, a so-called L infinity norm ball. Okay? Does it make, make sense? So that's the, okay. So, okay. Now we can also look at things like norm cones. This is super interesting. It's actually going to be kind of a theme in the class. Uh, is that we're going to be looking, a lot of times when we're looking at sets of, in dimension n, we will actually look at, we'll actually look at our n plus 1, where there's an additional thing. And in fact, you're used to this because this is like when you talk about the graph of a function, that's what you're doing, right? You, if you have a function on R2, you think of its graph. Well, its graph is something that lives in R3, and it consists of points that look like this, x1, x2, comma, f of x1, x2, and that's the graph, right? So, so this is going to be a common thing. So here, the set of xt, t is a scalar, x is a vector, for which the norm of x is less than t, that's actually a norm cone. By the way, you have to show that, right? If it's a cone, it says I can multiply the pair xt by 7, for example, and it's still in the cone. And that, that would be true here, because if I multiply x by 7, the norm goes up by 7, but so does t, so everything's cool, okay? And then an example would be, this is, this is what people call the Euclidean norm cone. Um, it's got all sorts of other names. Um, it's also called the second order cone. That, that's, a, that's a good way to say it. Other names are, oh, here's, here's a cool one. It's the Lorentzian cone because it's the inequality that comes up in special relativity. Although, actually, to be honest with you, the Lorentzian cone has actually got the bottom part too. So, which we don't do, right? So, but if it's, it's half of a Lorentzian cone, or people would just call that a Lorentzian cone. Um, and then somebody at some point tried to propagate uh, people referring to this as an ice cream cone. And I'm extremely happy to report it did not take. So, that, that's another name for this cone. Okay? So, um, okay. So, these are, and this just, we're just going over like here's some common convex sets. Next up, polyhedra and also polytopes. I'll say something about that. Um, so here's some notation that we're going to use throughout the class. Um, so um, that's a vector ax, and that's a vector. So I have a weird squiggly inequality between vectors, right? And what, what we're going to, this is going to be element-wise inequality between vectors, right? It means that every entry of one vector is less than or equal to every entry of the other one. That's what it means, OK? So, Ax less than b, if you think of it row by row, each row is a single linear inequality, right? So that's one way to, to, to think of it. And in fact, here, these, a, these ais, AI trans, these ai transpose are the rows of a, right? So basically, ax less than b says, well, a1 transpose x has to be less than b1, but that's a half space. That's everybody who lives on this side of this hyperplane, and that's the outward normal. Then, but also, A2 transpose X has to be less than B2, and that's everybody that lives on this side, right? But we have to satisfy all of those, so that's basically taking the intersection of these half spaces, and we get a set that looks like that. So, and that's called a polyhedron. Um, so it's, uh, it's literally the solution set of a set of linear inequalities. Okay, that's what a polyhedron is. And, um, there's several, some people call these polytopes. Then to make it more confusing, some authors, and, and actually weirdly, it's reversed and not consistent. Some authors say that if a polyhedron is bounded, it's a polytope. And some have the exact opposite convention. 
So just, and it turns out for us, it's not even going to matter. So just for us, they're going to be kind of the same. Okay. But just to warn you, you might be reading something somewhere and that author might have in their mind some idea that one of these two is bounded and whatever. Okay, so, and this is, uh, these are convex, right? So, okay. Um, here's an interesting cone. It's going to come up a lot. Um, so, I already mentioned this. Sn is a set of symmetric n by n matrices. Uh, by the way, what's the dimension of that set? We've got n squared numbers in it, right? So, what's the dimension? No, what's that? Yeah, it's n times n minus n plus one. It's n times n plus one divided by two, right? And the the reason is, you know, there's n squared numbers, but the upper half is the same as the bottom half, so it's redundant. Okay, so so that's a that's a vector space of dimension n n plus one over two. Okay, um, when we put a plus there, it's the set of things which are positive semi-definite. Now here we are basic. We are ah, we're doing something here. We are overloading the squiggly inequality sy symbol. Right? So you saw it on the previous slide between vectors, in which case it means element-wise inequality. Now it appears between symmetric matrices. And here it means it's, it's positive semi-definite. The difference is, actually, we'll, we'll get into that a bit later today. But that's, that's the picture, right? So that's, is, that, is that called polymorphism? Or what's it called when, you, when the, the semantics of a symbol depends on the syntactic context? Or is that just overloading? Doesn't matter. Somebody knows here. Come on. It's got to be some CS people here anyway. So fine. OK. Um, that's the idea. OK. So I mean, here's an example. Here's a quick example is, I mean, this is silly, but here's a 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, and we want to know, and, and so a general 2 by 2 symmetric matrix looks like x, y, y, z, because this has got to equal that. right? And the question is, when is that positive semi-definite? And you kind of know the answer, right? The answer is, this has got to be non-negative. That's got to be non-negative. And then the determinant has to be positive, right? And that says that xz is bigger than y squared. OK? So that's, that's, the, that's the last inequality. Um, and then, you know, here, we, here we've, we've drawn it for, uh, for x, y, and z. And it's, what it is is it's the interior of this, which we don't show or something. But it, that's, that's the boundary of it. Um, actually, you want to know something weird? If you twist your head just the right way, it turns out that is exactly the same as a second order cone, but kind of just rotated. <laughs> so, but it doesn't matter. This is what it is, right? So, OK. Um, and you know, look, positive semi-definite matrices are going to come up in many fields that I hope many of you have seen. I, obvious one is they are covariance matrices, just to start, right? Um, they describe ellipsoids, right? That's if you do stuff that's geometrical and you want to describe ellipsoids, they're parameterized by at some point in various different ways, but they're parameterized by positive semi-definite. So, so positive semi-definite matrices come up in a ton of different fields, right? OK, so, that is, uh, that, so that's the so-called PSD cone. That's what people would say. OK, so we could go on, and I could show you all sorts of entertaining convex sets. Um, but in fact, now we're going to get to how this actually really is going to work. So the way it's really going to work is, uh, you're act we're actually going to do this using a calculus, right? And so let, let's stop and talk about what calculus is, right? So, you know, calculus is, I mean, I mean, it's outmoded and silly, and I can't imagine that they force people to take it, but they still do. It's fine. But what it is is, if you think about it, 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 think about it, it's actually a really good way to be able to calculate derivatives of things, for example, right? And so... I tell you about some basic things like, you know, powers and sine and log. And then I tell you some rules like, you know, the derivative of a product, right? Or I don't know, you know, there's fancy rules too. It doesn't matter. So I tell you these rules. And then what you do is you take your basic things, which we're going to call atoms, which you know, like, oh, the derivative of sine is cosine. Okay. Right. And then, you know, you put it and then, you know, a couple of rules and with a couple of rules and knowing, you know, 30, 40 atoms, you're kind of in good shape, right? You can actually calculate, you know, you know the chain rule, and you can actually calculate the, you know, the gradient of uh, some logistic law, you know, multinomial logistic loss or something like that, right? Okay, so, so we're going to do actually something extremely similar. In spirit, identical. So, so we are channeling the 17th century here, or maybe 
18th or something to be fair. So, um, and so you've seen some basic convex sets, and then we're going to look at some some uh, some some methods that preserve convexity, right? And then you will you will show in a very effective method to know that a set is convex is to actually construct it using these rules, right? So another way to say that is we're going to bring, we're going to, we're going to have syntactic verification of convexity of a set, right? So what it means is you start by saying like, well, you know, that's an ellipsoid. That's an ellipsoid. Those are convex. That's a half space. That's a polyhedron. Then I intersect them or something. That's convex, right? And stuff like that, right? So, okay. But let, let, let's back up, because that's the correct way to do it. But I'll, I'll say something about d other ways, right? If a person walks up to you in the street and says, is this set convex or not, right? They can, that happens, by the way. Uh, it actually did happen to me once, which is weird. But I was in New York. It was very weird. OK, anyway, it, did, it actually happened. So OK, fine. Um, I think it happened because they'd seen me talk about this. And then they thought, well, hey, there he is. I'm going to go. Anyway, fine. So, OK. So, you know, how do you show a set is convex, right? Well, OK. So one way is just to roll up your sleeves and go, OK, let x1 be any point in the set. Let x2 be any point in the set. Let theta be between 0 and 1. And then just argue that this point, this mixture or convex combination of x1 and 2 is in the set, right? Now, that's the right thing to do. Almost never. I mean, every now and then you may have to fall back to that. But it should be the absolute last resort, right? Uh, so you, you don't want to do that, right? Um, oh, well, let me tell you. OK, for, so the way we're going to do it is actually going to be constructive or syntactic or by a calculus. And the way that's going to happen is what we're going to do is we're going to take a set C, and we're going to represent it as a bunch of operations applied to sets already known to be convex. A, ha a small number, the ones you've just seen already, half spaces, polyhedra, norm balls, norm cones, that's it. OK? That's what we're going to do. Um, now, some of these things are obvious, like intersection affine functions. We're gonna, I, you will see later today some things that are not obvious, like at all. OK? So, um, okay. so I, there's, there's, there's something else I, I didn't put on here. It's, it's actually like method. It could be method three or method zero. Um, I didn't want it on the slides for the reasons that will become clear when I tell you what it is. So here's another method. Here's a street fighting method for figuring out if something is convex. Uh, what you do is you write, I'm assuming you have uh, some code that will tell you if a point is in the set C. Let, let's, let's assume that, right? Then here's what you do. Also, you have some way of generating, let's say random, but just points inside C. So here's what you do. You write a code that does this. It generates two points inside C. It, it picks a, you know, a theta at random between 0 and 1, forms this thing, and then checks if it's in C. Everybody got my method? OK. Now you go to lunch. Everybody, that, this is critical. This is a very important part of this. You go to lunch now, OK? And, so, and you come back. And by the way, it, you make it halt the first time it finds a violation, right? Everybody, in which case, you know for sure it's not convex because it just produced an x1 and an x2 and a theta between 0 and 1. And the convex combination is not x1 and x2 are in C. Convex combination is not. Everybody got that? OK. So um, oh, in which case, you immediately remove all evidence that you ever did this. <laughs> you remove the script, right? So just it's gone. Like, don't push it or anything to GitHub. Or anything. Just, it's just gone, right? Then, then what happens is when you're hanging out with your friends or something, somebody says, I don't know, hey, do you think like the set of measures that blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing, some complicated thing, and you'd go like, of course that's not convex. That's what you, and they go, really? How did you know that? And you go like, uh, intuition, right? <laughs> so that's what you do. Okay, everybody following this? Okay. Now, suppose you come back from lunch, and it is, it's looked at 100 million different pairs x1 and x2, and it has not yet found a convex combination that's not in the set. Everybody following this? What precisely do you know at that time? Nothing. nothing. You know nothing whatsoever. OK? OK. This, by the way, this is still fine. Because now you can, then you can try to show it. And then in your next paper, you can say, well, look, this is uh, convex. It's not totally obvious, but here's a paragraph derivation. Or you could do that. OK? But if you fail 
you're still, you still win. You go to the next conference, you hang out with your friends, and they say things like, wow, is the set of blah, 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 you think that's convex? And you'd go, I think, I guess so. And they would say, how do you, how could you guess that? And you'd say, intuition, <laughs> right? Right. And then usually if you're, what'll happen is, you know, two months later, uh, somebody, I don't know, maybe a Russian grad student at the conference or something, will post something on archive showing that it isn't, con in which case you'll say like, oh, I knew that, right? <laughs> which, which is a lie, but okay, so fine. All right. So that, that's off the record. That, that was your method. That, that's, but, it, you know, it's actually not at all uh, a, bad, a bad thing to do. Like, I, I would not judge some, some. I mean, I would if it was something where, like, in three lines you could see it's convex. But if it's not obvious, I would totally. I personally, I, I'll go ahead and admit it right here in public. I've done that. <laughs> okay? And then I go right to my Russian friends and say, uh, is this convex? And then... And then we have a, a notion, if, it go, if I send an email to Yuri Nesterov, there's a delay. And then three days later, he says, I am not sure. That's, that's the equivalent of like, it's, it's unknown. It's, it's probably the equivalent of it's unknowable, actually. So anyway, that's, that's how I do it. Right. But anyway, so that's, okay, fine. Let's move on. Um, okay. So uh, we have the idea of intersection, right? So this is, you know, kind of obvious, right? I mean, this is you know, a little geometrically very obvious, right? If I have, here's, here's a convex set, right? Right? And, and here's another one, right? Right? And the intersection is this thing. And you know, look, your eyeball tells you it's convex. And by the way, a three line proof would tell you that it's convex too, okay? So, so the intersection of convex sets is convex. Actually, the intersection can be even an infinite number of, of, of uh, things can be, ha so we can talk about things like an infinite number, uh, the intersection of an infinite number of half spaces is convex, okay? Uh, so here's a, an example. Um, yeah, it's quasi-practical or something. It goes like this. So here's my set S. It, this is called a, uh, a trigonometric polynomial, right? So it comes up in lots of fields, right? Like in signal processing, for example, or whatever, but there it is. It's a, it's a, it, it, it's a set, uh, it's a linear combination of these functions, which is cosine, cosine 2t, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I guess you could also call it an even Fourier series or truncated. I, that, lots of people, you could call it lots of things, right? Fine. Okay. Then my set S is the set of coefficients for which this function is less than 1 as long for all t, absolute value t less than, what? Well, it, this is this is uh, symmetric, right? If I plug in minus t, it's the same thing. So I just it's basically t between zero and you know pi over three, right? So everybody got it. So that that's it. That that's my set, you know. And look, if you were in EE or something, you could say, oh, this is these are the things that satisfy uh, you know some filter that does something and blah blah blah. That's fine. Um, okay. So the question is, it convex, right? Um, I mean, it is, otherwise it wouldn't be as an example in, this, in the lecture, but you know, the question is, how do you show that, right? And in fact, it's not too hard to actually uh, just go brute force on this, right? And so to go brute force, what you'd do is you'd say, well, suppose I had two, two entries, two members of this set, right? So like, here's one, and I'm going to draw... I'm not the coefficients, but I'll draw the actual trigonometric polynomial. So here's one. And sure enough, look, it's between plus minus one out to pi over three. So here's one. And here's another one, okay? Like that, right? Then what I would do in my, in my head, and you could just start with the average, because, you know, if it doesn't hold for the average, it's, anyway, that's, so then you, then you ask yourself if I form the average of those two. Now, technically, I'm forming the average of the coefficients. But when I form the average of the coefficients, I get the average. I, I, I literally just average these two functions. And I get this dotted curve here, like that. And then we ask ourselves the question, if a function is between plus and minus one over this little boundary, right? And so is another one. And then I form the average of those two functions. Is it between plus and minus one over that? The answer is, yeah, of course it is. Yeah. So, so it's convex. There's, there's a, a, uh, a, a derivation of it. But we can also think it's a really cool way to think of S as an infinite intersection. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write that down because it's actually kind of interesting. It goes like this. It's the, it's the, it's the set of X for which, and then it's uh, here. I'll just write 
right, is less than one uh, for t uh, in you know zero you know pi over three, right? So it looks like looks like that, right? So I'm going to ask you a question. Um, let's say I need a number between zero and pi over three. Here it is, 0.6. Okay. So I would like you to tell me. What, what does this look like? What kind of, in fact, describe this geometrically. We, we haven't given a name for it yet. Uh, whoa, 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 very wrong, wrong. There you go. Uh, and this is, uh, this is for t equals 0.6. There, OK? Everybody got that? OK? So the question is, what, what does this look like? A subset. It's what? A subset. Uh, which set? A subset. The second one. Uh, uh, it's a it's a subset. Half, half it's a ha it's a half space. Is that what? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, actually, this that's a half space in X, right? So the it, in other words, the set of coefficients of trigonometric polynomials so that it eva at evaluated at point six is less than one. That's a half space in coefficient space. You know what? So is this one. Um, that's a half space. So it's the intersection of two half spaces. That's a polyhedron. Matter of fact, the two half spaces are just shifted, right? And if I ask you, what's the set of x for which, you know, let's say a transpose x, you know, uh, yeah, that's fine. I'll just do this, right? Is, is less than b, right? Note the absolute value here. That's actually a really cool thing. It looks like this, right? It's actually a slab. Here's a. And here's minus a. You can check me on that. So, so a, a really good name for this is it's a slab, right? Uh, and it's convex. It's the intersection of two half spaces, so it's convex, right? And so I'm going to think of this thing as this thing is the intersection over all t in 0 pi over 3 of, uh, I'm going to call this, the, I'm going to call it slab, s sub t is going to be the slab. So this set, whatever it is, it's an intersection of slabs, but it's an infinite intersection of slabs. It's one for every value of t. Uh, everybody got, got this, right? So over here, what you can see is we've, what these are, what these lines here, is each one corresponds to a t between 0 and pi over 3. And there are going to be two parallel lines here, two parallel lines. And basically, everything in between, that slab, those are the points for which that trigonometric polynomial at that point t is less, is less than 1 in absolute value. Everybody got that? And so basically, if you're in all of these, you're cool. And you can see, actually, it's curved. You know, the set is curved and weird stuff, but that's it. So does this make, make sense? OK. Now we get to uh, affine functions. So. Um, an affine function is basically a linear function plus a constant, right? By the way, there's a lot of confusion about that. And, you know, people talk about a linear model and a linear function when they mean affine. And I don't, it doesn't bother me as long as I know that they know what they're talking about. But it does bother me when I know that they don't know what they're talking about. So, so you're allowed to confuse affine and linear only if you absolutely for sure know the difference. Right, so, so for a while, I'll try to be good, and I'll just say affine when I mean affine, right? So it would be like you'd say piecewise linear function, right? What, you, what, you know what you really mean? You really mean piecewise affine. I mean, but it sounds weird. People call it piecewise linear, and you sound like kind of a jerk if you say things like, oh, I'm sorry, didn't, did you mean piecewise affine? And they're like, whatever, dude. Right, so, right, so that's, okay, fine. So that's an affine function. OK, so affine functions preserve convex sets. Ba basically, going forward, that's called the image, and actually pulling back. It's called the inverse image. So what it says is uh, the image, if, if you have a, a convex set and I apply an affine function to it, then, and I look at all, which means I apply the affine function to every element in the set, then that set is going to be convex. Okay? And these are just you know, straightforward to show. So is the inverse image. Now here, I have to talk about this for a minute. Um, everybody know f is a function, and f inverse has a definition, right? Um, in, in, uh, so 
The standard definition is that that's the inverse function. And so you wouldn't write f inverse unless f were invertible. But there's another completely standard use in mathematics of f inverse. And it is not a function, for sure. It means this. It's called the inverse image, is the way you say it. And it's the set. So if, if I, f inverse of a set is all of the things that get mapped into C. So that, that's the inverse image. OK? And that's just, it's absolutely completely standard. So every, by the way, it, do not confuse. By the way, if, if f is an invertible function, then there's a connection between this notation and the other one. Uh, but this is the absolute state. This is stand, you, worldwide. All mathematicians, anybody using math would know this, right? OK, so that's the inverse image. Both of these operations uh, preserve convexity, right? So here's an, uh, an example would be like you know, some kind of uh, projection, right? So I could go back here, and I could say, here's a, here's a beautiful one. Let's have trigonometric polynomials of degree 5 that satisfy this. Here's my linear mapping. I will simply take the first two coefficients. So I take x1 to x5, and I return x1, x2. That's obviously a linear mapping, right? And now I'll look at the inverse image of that convex set under that mapping. And then I'll, I'll say precisely what it is. It is the set, I'll, and I'll make it sound all fancy, but, you know, but it's not. I would say it's the set of all first two coefficients of a trigonometric polynomial that can be completed to a trigonometric polynomial that satisfies this. Everybody get that? I mean, it's getting weird and esoteric now, but still. Don't worry. It's fine. OK, so, okay. so that's, these are, these are uh, th those, those types of things. And now we're going to get good to one weird one, and it's something you didn't know. And, or, uh, oh, sorry, you didn't know and isn't obvious. And so this is it. Good. Because I hate, I hate the thought of having a whole lecture where everything is kind of like, duh, right? Or, well, I didn't say, I, you know, it's, it's just basic, right? OK, here it is. This is interesting. So the perspective function takes a pair of, uh, uh, it takes an n plus 1 vector, which we break up into a vector, an n vector, and a, a scalar, which we call x and t. And it simply divides by the last one, last entry, OK? So by the way, if you, if you work in vision, or some people do crazy affine transform. Uh, they do weird transformations this way. Like, I don't know, some people who do robotics do that. Anyway, so you might be familiar with this. Um, OK, so, uh, so this is called a perspective function. It is, of course, not linear, not remotely. Well, I mean, if you fix t, it's linear in x. But it is definitely not linear in, in t, OK? So that, that's a perspective function. Um, and it turns out images and inverse images of convex sets are preserved under uh, perspective functions. OK? And that's, that is not obvious, I think, remotely. OK? So, so and here, here's a good example. Uh, so if, if I combine this with a linear mapping, I get a so-called linear fractional function. So that's an affine fraction. No, that, you know, you should call it affine fractional, but whatever. So here. That's an affine function, and you divide by this a scalar affine function. This is called this is called linear fractional function. It looks like that. And by the way, our, our rule here is the domain is this thing's going to be positive, right? So that's a linear fractional function. They come up in a ton of applications. They come up actually. This is things like if you're conditioning in probability, right? It, this will that's a, conditioning is actually nothing but a linear fractional function on a, like a probability mass function, for example. It comes up in vision all the time, right? So for example, if I say, if I see a 3D thing and I want to know what is the image on my retina, let's pretend my retina is flat, right? So if I, if I say, what is it? The answer is, it's a linear fractional function. That's what it is, right? And you know this, right? Like because, look, if I, if I hold this like this and I look at it, um, I mean, you kind of know what, what's happening here, right? I mean, let's make it, I, this is good enough here. I'll, I'll uh, yeah, so, the, so obviously this is closer, so that's actually kind of bigger. Now, my, our brains have evolved to handle that, and that's a cue that this is closer than that. But, 
But whatever the image is, like in a photograph or on my retina, it's definitely not a linear mapping, right? So that's, that, that's, a, that's a linear fractional uh, function. So when, if you want to believe this, it's, you, it's, you know, it's in the book. You could read it. It's like, you know, whatever, half a page to prove it. It's not hard. Um, but, you know, a good, a good way to think of it intuitively is this, um, is what I'll show you, I'll argue, this is just going to be completely intuitive and geometric, but I'm going to argue that line segments get mapped to line segments. That's, and that's good enough. Because then if, I, if my function is convex, and I, I know that every line segment you know, that you, that, that's in your set you know, gets mapped to one, then that, that, that's good enough. Okay? So then the question is this. Here's a line segment, and I look at it. Okay? So I look at my, and, I, and I, then we ask, what does it look like on my retina? The answer is, it's a line segment. Do we agree? It's that in, two, in two dimensions, right? Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question just to make sure we're not fooling ourselves here. The midpoint of this thing maps to a point on my retina. Is it the midpoint of the line segment on my retina? No, it is not. Okay, so that tells you you're not. Oh, by the way, unless I'm like way, way far away, and that's an approximation, of, that's an approximation right? If you have a telephoto lens, that's a pro, that, that image mapping, image formation, it's pretty much linear, right? but not if you're up close, okay? So, so that was, that's my visual argument that uses a, a pencil to, uh, to argue that perspective mappings preserve convexity. Okay, um, here's just a quick example uh, to see what this looks like, right? So here's a, here's a linear fractional function. It's, it's x, you know, divided by, you just scale x wherever you are. How you scale it? depends on this denominator, which is x1 plus x2 plus 1. We assume that's positive, so that says that you live over here. This is like the netherworld. We don't go there, right? But this is where it's positive. And this, this coefficient here, right over here, it's, it's gigantic, right? And it gets smaller and smaller and smaller the farther you go away. So this, if this is the set C, this is the image under F of C. And it's this bump right here that translates over to there. Okay? And you know, a good way to understand this is take this thing, put it on the ground like that, and now fly a drone over it and look down. And you get, get close enough. That, I mean, I think the word is foreshort it's foreshortening, right? So you get close enough that, in fact, this thing is closer to you, so it looks all big, looks like, and that's what it's going to look like. So that's why these, these things look very familiar to us because, well, hey, it's how our eyes work, right? So everybody got this? And it is not remotely obvious that, this, that these preserve convexity, but they do. And we'll see some crazy consequences of this later in various practical uh, settings. It's going to be super interesting. Okay. Next topic is uh, generalized uh, inequalities. So we've actually already seen two, and we've already seen the two most important ones. So let me explain what it is. Um, so Suppose I have a convex cone. Uh, now, what that means, you know, it's a proper cone if it's closed, so it, it contains you know, limits or whatever. We don't, again, that's analysis, and we don't have to worry about it. Um, it's solid. That's a, that's a technical term that means it has non-empty interior. Okay? So, um, and it's pointed, which means it contains no line. Again, I think these are really good. We're, I don't know who chose these words, but excellent choice, I think right, because they, they're completely evocative. Um, okay, so here's an example. Is the non-negative orthant? That's a famous one, right? It's going to come up a lot. You know, non-negative orthant, I mean, it looks like, it's kind of a weird name, right? In 2D, it's just this thing, right? In 3D, there's eight orthants, and it's one of them. It's, it's like orthant number one, or how, I, don't know how you, I don't know how people name those, right? In fact, I don't even know what this is. How people, is this quadrant two or quadrant? I don't, this, anyway, whatever your quadrant labeling method is, this is, one of the, is a quadrant, right? So why you would call it orthant in higher dimensions, I don't know, but it's what stuck. Okay? So language is weird. And it's just, so it's a set of non-negative vectors, right? Um, positive semi-definite cone, we already, we already saw that. But it turns out, you know, it, it's closed, right? And it's, it's solid. In other words, there is no matrix that is positive semi-definite. Uh, and it's negative is positive semi-definite. Oh, except zero. That's the only one, right? So that's what it means to be pointed. Okay? Um, 
And you know, you get weird stuff like the, the, the set of coefficients of polynomials that are non-negative on some interval, right? I'm just, I'm just mentioning this because there's some just weird, weird ones, right? So, so these are called, uh, th these are, these are going to be called proper cones. Um, and let, let me explain, let, let me show you some improper cones in R2 just to make it clear. So, uh, so uh, oh, here's a cone. Oh, by the way, this is just called a ray, right? So it's all points that go, that, that are multiples of you know, this vector and just go off that way. That's called a ray, okay? It's a cone. It's a convex cone. It, where does it fail? What does it fail there? Which, 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 what does it violate? Solid. It's not solid. That's right. So solid means it's got to have some interior. Um, okay. Um, here's a cone. Is a half space. That's totally a cone in R2. How does it fail? It's not pointed. Why? Because look at this. Here's a point. You know, here's a line that is contained in that cone. And that's, that violates the idea that it is, uh, it's pointed. Okay? So how about this? For, here's, how about this cone? How about that one? That's good. Right? That's pointed, solid, whatever. It's a cone. Okay? All right, fine. Okay, so we will use uh, proper cones to define a generalized inequality among vectors, right? And so the way you do that is we'll just say, when you say x is less than y, you would pronounce this, if you were being super fancy, you'd say x is less than y with respect to the cone k. That'd be how you'd say it, okay? But all it means is that y minus x is in the cone, right? And you know, look, you already do this. If you say one, if you know one matrix is, is you know, one symmetric matrix is bigger than another, right? If you build an, you know, if, if this is your estimation covariance and this is someone else's estimation covariance and yours is bigger than theirs, then theirs is better than yours, right? But this has no judgment here, right? So that's, that's what that means. So, okay. Um, now, lots of things you can, you know, if you do this with, you know, the cone, the non-negative orthod, this inequality turns into just ordinary element-wise inequality. And by the way, most people actually write that these days. This is, this is, you just write it this way. I mean, it's polite for the next 10, 15, 20 years before the language converges to, to at first use of this to say where the inequality means element-wise, okay? But we'll use, you know, we'll use the squiggly here. I mean, I don't know why, if I, I don't know. If I were going to change the book, I'd probably not use the squiggly for that, but it doesn't matter, okay? Um, and the same is true uh, for matrix inequality, right? That, that you, you know, these are so common that we drop this and, just so basically from now on, you see a squiggly inequality between vectors, it means element wise. You see a squiggly inequality between two symmetric matrices, it means, I mean, some people call it what, the loner ordering or something, that's very fancy ways to say it. It means in the, the, the you know, the difference is positive semi-definite, that's what it means, okay? So that, that's how that works. Um, now it turns out, you know, when you're making, you know, a notation as an inequality, whole point of making notation is I mean, so the idea of notation is you want it to evoke something that you already know about. Everybody here knows about inequality between numbers. Everybody here. So you know, it's like a norm, an absolute value. You want, the notation is close. It's supposed to evoke that, right? Now, it can't be just that or then it's silly. It's not a generalization, right? So, but the difference, so what you really want is you want when, whenever you see something like this where we're going to overload or extend some symbol in a more, in a more sophisticated setting, um, it, you're, in, you're supposed to import your intuition, right? So you'd say, yeah, well, you know, A is less than B and C is less than D, then I think A plus B should be less than C plus D. Most of those things you think are true and some are false. So you got to be on your toes to know which is, which is correct and which is not. Okay, that, and that's your job, right? But th that's, what, that's what good notation is for, right? That's like, think about matrices, right? You just, what are you doing? You say, I'm just, seriously, you're, just, you're multiplying three numbers and you're like, no, dude, that's a 10,000 by 1,000 matrix, that's a vector, that's blah, blah, blah. You see what I'm saying? 
right? But it looks the innocent, the, the notation looks super innocent. So the, that's kind of the idea behind good good notation design. Um, okay. Um, okay. So the main what is the main difference with vectors is well, it's kind of obvious, right? Um, if your base model for what an inequality is is inequality on R, then that's got a property which is extremely important. It's called a total ordering, and that means that for any two numbers, either one's less than the other or the other way around, period. Like, that's, that's what it means to be a linear ordering or total ordering. Those would be the fancy names in math, you would say. Okay? Now, for vectors, that's just not the case, right? So um, that's interesting, right? So, I mean, for example, yeah, I mean, I just, let's just do a couple of examples. Let's, uh, let's look at the inequality uh, that looks like this, right? Um, right? This says this two vector is less than or equal to that one, right? What it means is that x is less than u and y is less than v, okay? So it's extremely easy to find two points where neither two vectors, where it is, both, it is false that one is less than the other and the other way around. It's not a linear ordering. I mean, this is kind of obvious, right? And this is going to come up later when, for example, these become multiple objectives that we want small, right? Like, you know, I want, I want to have a good, a good fit on the, you know, I want to have good training data fit, and I also want the complexity of the model to be low, right? Then these are just going to be two different things. And then you're going to have, you will have incomparable uh, designs, right? That, that, that it, will, it will neither be true that one is bigger than the other. So what happens now is you have, from your, your intuition about numbers, you have ideas involving minimum, right? Like you can talk about the minimum of a bunch of numbers. Okay, guess what? You cannot talk about the minimum, but you can talk about the minimum of a set of vectors, but it's a very specific thing. What happens is because it's not a linear ordering, a bunch of ideas that were the same on R, they bifurcate. And now it turns out that all your intuition about minimum, all this kind of stuff in R, now there's going to be two concepts, and actually they are minimum and minimal. Okay, so this is the this is the picture. And again, this is like weird and abstract right now. All of this is going to have a lot of applications later. Okay, so um, so here's the definition. No, minimum is super strong. It basically says this is a minimum element, means everything else in the set is comparable to me, and bigger. Period. Okay, that's that's so. For example, in the minimum, ent the, the minimum element of, of a set in, let's say, in R2 with respect to the second order cone, this is, a, this is a perfect example. S1 has a minimum point, and it's this one, right? Because everything in this set is comparable to this point and bigger in, in, the, in the vector sense, right? So that, that's minimal. Um, and it's easy to see you can have a set that doesn't have a minimal point. There's just, sorry, minimum. Ah, sorry, okay, minimum point. Doesn't have a minimum point. Okay, now minimal is a weaker term, and it says this. A point is minimal if, if, if any point which is in the set and better than or equal, to, or less than or equal to you, then it's you. So no one, there, there's no point in the set that is less than or equal to you, except you. There, that's, that's, that's the right way to say it, right? And so here's a picture here. And geometrically, what it says is, here, you're saying that every point is comparable to it. This, this uh, orthant, or shifted orthant, that's all the points that are comparable to x1 and bigger than or equal to it. That's this thing. And sure enough, every single point in the set is, in, is inside that set. Over here, this says, that if you look at the points which are less than or equal to you, that's this down here, right? These, these two orthants are the set of points that are incomparable to you, right? So this says you're comparable. If, if you're comparable and less than or equal to you, then the only way, and you're in this set, the only point is this intersection. It, it can be that, right? So, so this has got lots of names. It comes up in a gazillion fields. We'll see it's, um, sometimes these are called, uh, in, depending on the context, they're going to be called like Pareto points or efficient designs or something like that. Yes? I that that defines the set of all comparable points. Which one? You said the back orthant. Down here? Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, oh, this, this is all the points that are less than or equal to x2. Right? You can check me on that. Oh, well, comparable means either the inequality works one way or the other. This is awesome, but we should, we should, I, we should quit. We're actually even a minute over. So, but it, it's fun. Cool. We'll, we'll quit here, and we'll, we'll continue the slog next week. <laughs>